Welcome to A Fostered Life, the show in which we explore the various facets of foster care through the voices of the many people who participate in the system. I'm your host, Christy Tennant Crispin, and this is Episode 10. According to the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, or RAIN, one in nine girls and one in 53 boys under the age of 18 experience sexual abuse or assault at the hands of an adult. The effects of child sexual abuse can be long-lasting and can have a profound effect on a victim's mental health. Victims are four times more likely than non-victims to develop symptoms of drug abuse and or experience PTSD as adults, and they're three times more likely to experience a major depressive episode as adults. Out of the 63,000 sexual abuse cases substantiated by Child Protective Services in any given year, 80% of perpetrators of sexual violence against children were parents. Many of those children are placed in foster care, and it's vital for foster parents to be equipped to support children who've been traumatized sexually. My guest in today's episode is Kevin, a man who knows all too well how being sexually abused as a child affects a person's life. As he shares from his experience, Kevin offers invaluable insight and advice for those of us who may be called on to care for children who are victims of sexual violence. I'm so grateful for Kevin's transparency, vulnerability, and willingness to share about this extremely hard topic. And I know that you're going to gain as much from this conversation as I did. I always like to start out by asking people when their lives first intersected with the foster care system, but in this case, yours (laughs) never did. (laughs) Not necessarily, no. No. So, um, but there is a reason that I wanted to speak to you today. So maybe you can, would you tell me a little bit about um, how you look, when you're looking back on your childhood, what that looked like? Um, Certainly. I, uh, so I, I was, born in California, and uh, my father left when I was very young. I was only three, and shortly after that, um, I was abused by an older family member, sexually abused by an older family member, and that was actually the first memory I really have. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where my whole childhood began. Um, And to be clear, you were like around four at that time? Three, three and a half, four? Three and a half to four. It was in the summer, so I was, you know, I, my birthday's in September, so it was a couple months before I turned four. The only reason I'm asking is because I do, I hear from people a lot who ask me, do you think kids can remember that far back? And so I'm just pausing to say, yes, they can remember that far back. I, I remember this my whole life. Mm-hmm. I It never went away. Some people repress memories and they reoccur, but for me, it was there my whole life. And uh, there were other abuse times, you know, other times that I'd been abused that I, I still repress. I mm-hmm. think they came at an older age. I was abused by a, an older sister of a friend of mine when I was around 11, and it's still pretty repressed. I think the trauma at that time, when I was more aware of what was happening, yeah, and I was also more. Um, there were, you know, certain things I did to protect myself, and I think I repressed it more. So I don't really remember it entirely, but yeah, I do. You know, it never went away. It, it haunted me my whole life. Um, the but the rest of my childhood was, was actually really pretty good in some ways because, um, well, my mother was working, so she wasn't home a lot, and my older brothers were taking care of me, but they weren't home a lot, so I spent most of my time with my friends, and we had a lot of friends where I lived in San Carlos, and so a lot of my time was just running around on my own, which was pretty exciting in some ways, but there was also a lot of isolation and loneliness because I was dealing with abandonment at 
from my father and also feeling abandoned by my mother because she wasn't around a lot. Yeah. So there was a lot of loneliness, too. And then when I was 13, my father came back because he had basically hit rock bottom. And he was alcoholic and also abusive verbally and physically. And my mother took him back because he had nowhere else to go, really, besides jail or the streets. So at that time, we fought a lot. I didn't like my father, and um, I didn't like that he was drinking. And so that's where my childhood kind of took a turn for the dark because I just was not happy that he was back. And uh, we moved to Seattle then, so I lost all my friends that I had in San Carlos. And where we moved in Seattle, there wasn't really many kids in the neighborhood. So again, I was kind of isolated and dealing with an abusive and alcoholic father. And so my teenage years were pretty much a hell. I don't know how else to describe it. It was pretty awful. I I did have some friends, but I think that's where I turned to drugs and alcohol just to cope. And uh, that that was a coping mechanism, but it wasn't a very helpful one or healthy one. Yeah. Yeah. The the parallels between your life and a lot of the children that we as foster parents who a lot of people who are listening to this are foster parents, um, there are some striking parallels. And I think I really wanted to speak with you because as I was listening to you share um, a few weeks ago about your experiences and really how they formed a lot of how the rest of your life went, at least until, you know, until well into adulthood, it occurred to me how similar um, your experiences were to a lot of the kids that we have in foster care. And as foster parents, a lot of times we get into foster care because we want to do a good thing. We want to help. We want to be a safe place for kids, but we actually have no idea the effects that trauma has Um, the effects that trauma have on children and not just children, but well into adulthood. So I kind of would love to, you know, um, as much as you're willing to share, talk about how these experiences of your childhood, sexual trauma, multiple times, I mean, more than once, um, and then um, abuse and a lot of the things, the abandonment stuff, just the isolation, the feeling alone, how that formed you and shaped the direction your life went in. And, um, and how you came to the point where you began to actually confront those things in your adult years. Um, and I don't know how to ask a, a better question about that, but just you talked about, you talked about how um, you turned to drugs and alcohol and those yeah. became kind of part of your coping mechanisms. What, what brought you from that point to the point in your life when you said, I have to actually look back at these things in my childhood and deal with them? Well, it was, uh, wasn't was actually something that I did, but it was actually, I, I never intended to tell anyone what happened. And for male survivors, that's not uncommon. The shame is so prevalent. Um, you know, Abuse has very similar effects on on you know men and women, but the impact of what the expectations are on men and women are so different. For men, you're not supposed to be a victim ever. It's right. just not okay if you're a man. You 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 know there's these rules about what it is to be a man and a woman, and certainly that's changing in in our time right now, you know, there's a lot more flexibility, but when I was growing up, you know, there were just certain rules about being a man, yeah. and one of them was you, you just can't be a victim. I yeah. mean, even a four-year-old, like, and looking back. It, yeah. yeah, you just, it didn't matter, you know, yeah. boys had certain things, they had to be tough, you couldn't be a, you know, you couldn't be a baby, a crybaby, and yeah. so forth, you know, you're supposed to 
you know, brush it off and be a man, right? That's yeah, what we say. Exactly. Be a man. I hate that phrase, by the way. But anyway, okay, go ahead. <laughs> I do too. Um, I do too. But so, what was really the turning point for me was I was in a previous marriage, and uh, my wife, my ex-wife's sister, came out to her family about being abused. And we were, this was when I was in my early 30s, and she was in her late 20s. And my wife, at the time, didn't necessarily believe her, mainly because she felt like, why did she take so long? Um, mm. Very similar to what happened with the Kavanaugh case and right. so forth. You know, why, why didn't she say something then? Mm-hmm. And at the time, I had never told anyone. Yeah. So I told my wife, well, I completely believed her and I understood why she couldn't talk about it because I also was a survivor of abuse. And I told her and that that was the first time I told anyone. Wow. And that's when I realized that um, I couldn't keep it a secret any longer. It just, it kind of just came welling up inside of me and in support of her sister I just said look yeah I've been keeping this a secret and that's not uncommon for men to just repress it and hide it their whole lives Um, Mm -hmm. so I began to go to therapy because at the time I started talking about a lot of emotions started coming up that I had kept bottled up all my life. Yes. And I wasn't, I was really overwhelmed and didn't know how to deal with a lot of it. So after going to therapy was when I realized that, you know, I was using drugs and alcohol as a coping mechanism and they weren't working as well as they did when I just, use them to hide my feelings. Hmm. And so I had to address that as well. And that's when um, I realized I had to confront the man who had abused me because he was a part of my family and in family interactions and so forth, I had to deal with them more than I was comfortable. Hmm. Because whenever we had an interaction, I would have a reaction. I would basically disassociate or turn turn off mentally and emotionally. I had to, to, to be able to be near or with him. I couldn't actually completely be there. It was yeah. too much of a trigger. Yes. So I had to confront him and my whole family about this to tell them, I I just can't do this anymore. I couldn't be around him or be on the phone with him or anything. I had to control our interactions. I had to tell him, look, you can't call me anymore. I can't see you unless, you know, I, unless I say it's okay. And I I basically just cut off interacting with him. Mm -hmm. So that was, but, before then, yeah, drugs and alcohol were just an easy way to cope with my feelings mm-hmm. because I was not comfortable having those feelings. Yeah. Were they things? Uh, were these things that you thought about like consciously, or was it more sort of in your body that you can see how it continued to affect you? Like when you saw him, were you thinking about what he had done or was it more just sort of like, I don't like this person? (laughs) I wasn't necessarily consciously thinking about the events. Um, He abused me for months, so it wasn't just one event. Hmm. Um, But it was more of an unconscious panic association. Yeah. I would just... And... I didn't consciously check out. It just happened. Uh, it was one of my coping mechanisms. I would right. just, you know, disassociate, go elsewhere, and mm-hmm. just not 
be there while he was around or when he called. I mean, I was literally interacting fairly normally with him if he would call me, mm-hmm. but I would, I would physically or mentally check out and afterwards I would still be checked out. I mean, there were lasting effects after I'd been around them. And I think that was the main problem for me was that it caused me to be just mentally and emotionally gone for a while. I, I would just be, I wouldn't be able to interact emotionally. I would just be checked out. And it, it just, um, I think for a lot of survivors, you have coping mechanisms you're not even aware of. You're, especially when, for me, it happened at such a young age. Um, yes. You literally have to um, survive somehow. And what your mind and does to survive, you're not even aware of sometimes until you go back and realize that, you know, this is how I dealt with things and how I still deal with things sometimes. Yeah. When you disclosed, um, did your family believe you and did he acknowledge, what was that? Did he acknowledge what he had done? Yes, he did, fortunately, which is, um, doesn't always happen. Uh, A lot of, a lot of the, perpetrators will deny it or or try and dismiss it. And uh, he did, he did admit it and uh, confess. And um, yes, my family believed me and they were supportive of me. Although um, this is one of the hardest things I've ever had to deal with because it literally broke my mother's heart. And, I had never blamed her or felt like she didn't protect me. Um, I knew she was doing as much as she could at the time. I mean, it was so hard for her, and I never felt like, you know, she wasn't there for me. I just knew she was just trying to be there for us, but she had so much to, you know, she had four kids that she was trying to raise by herself. Yeah. And it, it... literally did break her heart and that broke part of me when that happened. I felt so bad. I never wanted her to bear my burden, but I, I had no other way of doing this. I, I literally, I had to confront him just so I can set up these boundaries. Yes. Yeah. So, but that doesn't always happen. A lot of times the perpetrators will, excuse it or dismiss it or say it wasn't, didn't happen. I mean, it's really hard to confront your abuser. It doesn't always, you know, the expectations you have of what may happen don't always line up with what really does happen. Yeah. And so I, it's, it's a really hard step to take yeah. for someone. If yeah. They've been abused. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Well, one of my goals in talking to you today is really thinking about um, people who are caring for kids who um, are not decades away from this kind of trauma, but are like weeks or months away from it. I just yesterday, I mean, just yesterday, I heard from a woman who is a brand new foster parent. They've never had kids. They just got approved for their license and they got called for an 11 year old girl who has a history of sexual trauma, and she was asking me, you know, do you think that we should say yes to her? And um, I didn't, I don't know this woman at all. She just reached out to me through my, you know, online presence. So she was, you know, not someone I know. So I don't know her. I don't know what her background is. But I just said, you know, when you are entering into this with someone, um, especially a child who is still right in the middle of their own processing of it and it's all so fresh and everything you have to be really committed to learning as much as you can about trauma and about how it affects people and so part of wanting to talk to you is to help people who are listening begin to gain some understanding Um, for example like you said it's so hard for anyone who's a victim to confront or you know to call out their abuser 
And when that, yeah. when that abuser is a family member and you're a child and they're an adult, I mean, there's just so many dynamics at play. Um, and I know you were an adult when you, when you, when you, you know, began to really deal with this. As you look back on your on the when you were a child, do you, and I know you've also talked with a lot of other survivors, what are some things that you think it's really important for caregivers to, to understand or to know um, when it comes to children who are experiencing these traumas? I mean, I'm thinking of sexual trauma. I'm also thinking of physical abuse and, you know, yeah. um, all of that. Well, the most important is just for providing a safe place, um, especially for boys. They might not ever want to talk about it. So I, I think it's important not to push them to talk if they're not comfortable, but to give them a safe place and for them to know that it is a safe place. And um, also, um, your expectations might not meet what they're ready to provide you as far as they might not even act like they're happy to be there. Uh, they might be so isolated and so um, humiliated. The betrayal that happens when you're abused is it destroys your self-esteem. Yeah. Uh, they might not be able to acknowledge even that they're um, appreciative of your care for a while, but it is important to them to have a safe place, to be themselves, to... And also um, that you affirm what they're doing. I, I I was very isolated, and I didn't always get anyone acknowledging, you know, that I did well in class, that I was doing good in school, that I got good grades. A lot of times, no one even recognized where I was, and and just that affirmation, you know, hey, good job. I'm, like the way you did that. And, uh, you know, uh, survivors react in different ways. And for men, there's a couple ways. Uh, you're kind of limited. I mean, because, you know, the expectations of what you're supposed to be when you're a boy and a man, when you've been abused, you learn things that are really wrong. Mm-hmm. And you either learn that you're either a victim or a perpetrator or you just give up. And sometimes, unfortunately, um, they learn that rather than be a victim, you have to be a perpetrator. And, mm-hmm. and that happens. And Or they just resign and resign to being a victim. Um, <clears throat> it's really important to just give them assurance and and help them with their self-esteem because um, I know I I reacted by basically resigning to being a victim and since no one was actually there to really support me um, I just kind of fell into that cycle of being a victim and, and being victimized but I I also was very empathetic I think one of the things that survivors have a strong sense of empathy they really you know you find a lot of people in protector type jobs like you know at, at hospitals and emergency rooms or the um, nurses and you know the medics firemen, so forth, people that are in, like, the protector jobs, mm-hmm. therapists, social workers, a lot of them are survivors because they they have a strong sense of empathy towards other people that are victims or, or suffering. Yeah. And uh, I know when I was young, I had a strong sense of empathy towards animals. I, I had a lot of pets, and they were very unusual pets a lot of the times. They were just critters I would catch. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, my mom, even though she had 
she did not enjoy reptiles or amphibians <laughs> or any of those animals. She allowed me to kind of get away with that. And I always had a collection of strange animals, but I always just had a strong, I, I, even today I have a real sense of empathy towards animals. I don't even like killing spiders. I, I have mm-hmm. to take them outside. I mm-hmm. just can't do it. And I think allowing the children to have their, um, their sense of self, uh, and, and, you know, boosting them, their sense, their self-esteem, like giving them credit for what they, they do enjoy. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that that's weird, I know, and I've, I've recognized this lately after being 10 years away from it, but I, I was into what you would call back then. They didn't call it goth, but you would call it goth. Now I was into kind of very dark and kind of grim movies and books and so forth. I loved haunted stories and I loved creepy movies, creepy things like that. And um, Halloween used to be one of my favorite Mm -hmm. times of year. And I think there's a sense of, I understood it because I, I was used to chaos. Mm -hmm. I was used to, it, it didn't bother me like it bothers some people. And it, it kind of gave me a sense of power because it didn't bother me. I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And so I was very into weird things back then. And it gave me a feeling of uh, power in a way. I, I enjoyed it and kind of got, I don't know how to put it. Um, I think it just, because it didn't bother me as much as it bothered other people. Mm-hmm. I felt a little superior because of that. And and I think that's not uncommon um, because coming from such chaotic, such, you know, disturbing childhood, I was used to it and I understood it. And it was almost a, a familiar thing for me. It was mm-hmm. almost like I, uh, you know, not comfortable, but it, it was kind of comfortable. Sure. We, we talk all the time about how it, f- um, familiarity breeds comfort, even when familiarity is something that, you know, we might look at and say that's really um, unhealthy or something. There are children who grow up in... in um, abusive situations, but at least it's abuse that they, they know they, they can predict and that kind of predictability brings yeah. comfort, even when it's not good, you know? Yeah. But I think it's okay to allow them to, you know, maybe explore that, mm-hmm. but as long as it's not an obsessive thing, fortunately for me, it wasn't like an obsess- obsession. Mm-hmm. thing but it was a form of comfort for me it mm-hmm. was a form of like I got it you mm-hmm. know yeah I think I think for a foster parent it is really important to just allow them to be themselves and not push them to um, try and conform mm-hmm. but definitely affirm and and give them credit for what they what they're good at, what they like to do, and just giving them a safe place, even though they might not respond necessarily at first. Mm-hmm. But just having a safe place is so important. Yeah. Um. I you know I I remember when I was a teenager, a girl asked me to her. It was I don't think it was Young Life, but it was very similar to Young Life. It was a Christian kind of gathering for teenagers. And when I went there, it seemed like such an alien environment to me because everyone was so nice Mm -hmm. and the family was so nice and everything about it. I just, I yearned to be a part of that, but I also felt like I just didn't belong. Mm -hmm. I I knew I didn't belong. 
so I, I only went that one time, but I just, I really envied that setting of just happiness and safety and, you know, people were, they cared about each other. Yeah. That was, you know, that's all I really wanted. I just did not feel like I belonged there. There are... Because I just, you know, that's not where I came from. Yeah, yeah. There are three words that you have used and concepts that you've used several times that are really um, affirming of what I kind of have come to as, as, as the approach that I encourage probably any parent to take, but um, especially foster parents. And the words are um, empowerment, like looking for ways, always looking for ways to empower your kids, um, empowering them to make choices. I'm really a believer in giving kids choices as much as possible just to give them, you know, all along the way, whether it's how they dress or um, even, you know, to a large degree, um, what they eat, although that's a different story because depending on the age, I do yeah. think we need to, you know, to pr- provide healthy choices <laughs> even when it's not what they want all the time. But, um, but empowering kids and then, um, a sense of, um, strength, like really af- like f- affirming what they're good at and seeing what they're good at. I kind of, I call it like kids yeah. need to know we see them as they are and we, we know them because I think kids want to be known. We all want that, right? We want to be known and seen for who we are. And, um, and then the third idea is the sense of belonging. And, um, when, you know, you think about a child who has been in a really chaotic or abusive environment and then is suddenly in a home maybe where, you know, it's not. <laughs> and it's it's like uh-huh. we might think, well, surely they feel safe now. But no, because the, uh, the, the, the discomfort of being in an unfamiliar environment, even when that environment is safe. I mean, it's important for people to understand kids aren't going to feel safe just because they are safe. <laughs> yeah. No, and it might be so unfamiliar that they, they don't feel like they belong. Mm-hmm. Um, and they might they might either isolate themselves more or find a way kind of out of it to a place that is more familiar or more comfortable that they feel. Yeah, that that's so true. Um, and just giving them a sense that they belong, you accept them for who they are for, Mm -hmm. you know, regardless. And that's so important, but I, I do feel it's important not to, press too hard to get them to reveal what happened to them or, mm-hmm. or even for boys trying to press them to reveal what they're feeling because I didn't know how to express my feelings well and I was also very afraid of my feelings. Um, feelings were a scary thing yeah. when I was you know, growing up and to express my feelings I thought was a dangerous thing. So sometimes it's so hard for a child to express what they're feeling because they think it's either dangerous or they don't even understand what they're feeling necessarily. Yeah, yeah. especially so at you, that you age. Might have to, yeah, you might have to just accept that they just can't talk about it very yeah. well. Yeah, we, we've seen a lot of kids who've come through um, our home, but also you know, different relationships that we're in with other foster parents. And then of course, in my work with a fostered life, I I hear from people all over and it's really common for kids who have traumatic histories to have a lot of rage and like tantrums or just anger. Um, Mm -hmm. And they're not talking about, they're not, they could they couldn't even begin to tell you what they're angry about they're just really angry very easily triggered you know um the something that to an emotionally healthy child would be a shrug the shoulders and walk away to a child who has experienced trauma it's like it's like i'm going to cry for an hour and i'm going to beat the wall and slam the door and you know and it's over something so small i mean i can't, i've seen this over and over and over again and and at first i was completely unequipped. I had no idea what was going on. And now I, you know, um, 
I will have a child who, you know, is just, is just beside themselves with, you know, with rage. And it took me a while to learn that anger is a much safer reaction than fear. It's all based in the same thing though. I mean, it's based in fear, but they feel stronger when they're expressing it with anger. We all do. I mean, I'm exactly like that. And I'm a 44 year old woman. When I'm afraid of something, I get real angry. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah it's easier exactly mm-hmm. well and and anger is a, a almost a way of controlling it rather than giving into it yeah and um i it took me a long time to learn what my triggers were and what i had i i still do have um rage mm-hmm. and i still have ptsd mm-hmm. effects of ptsd and i'm a lot more equipped to recognize and deal with it now. Yeah. But the trauma hasn't completely worn off. I mean, there's still times, but I do recognize my triggers now, but it, it took a long time. And sometimes I, I completely get blindsided and, um, and I'll be blown away for a day or two. Just first there'll be a trigger, then the reaction, and then, the counter reaction, which is generally just kind of a depression mm-hmm. from having reacted, you know, I feel worth worthless because I had such a reaction. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. The triggers though are really hard because sometimes you don't even know. Sometimes it's for me, sometimes it's smell. Um, certain smells, uh, I know for me, I, I can't have a male barber or a male doctor or a male dentist or a male massage therapist, anything like that. You know, just having a man in that kind of a intimate situation where it's forced intimacy, is it just sends me over the edge. I can't do it. Um, and my wife didn't rec- recognize, I didn't know about this and all this time I'd always go to a, a female doctor or a female barber and she'd be like, you know, well, why don't you go, you know, the kids really like this barber. I'm like, no, I can't. Mm-hmm. I just can't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But even certain smells will trigger it. And, um, I won't even recognize that at the time sometimes. And sometimes it, it's so hard to describe how it affects you. Um, yeah. because, I don't even understand, but I think you just have to accept that there are times they don't even understand what's going on in in their lives. Um, This gets to something very practical for listeners who are foster parents to consider when you have children who come to you. You don't always know. In fact, often you don't know, at the beginning anyway, uh, what the circumstances are of their past. Um, yeah. We had a we had a boy once who the night he arrived at our house and he's not with us anymore. I haven't seen him in years. Um um but the night he arrived at our house he um disclosed all of the abuse that he had experienced and he he had he had been abused. He had been in foster care. Um he had been through therapy. He had then returned home. And then he came back into foster care and was at our house shortly after coming back into foster care. And, you know, so he had the language down, like he knew because he had already been through kind of all this counseling for it. But so he disclosed, but if he hadn't, I never would have known what had happened, you know, what his circumstances were. Most of the time though, that isn't the case. I guess why I'm saying that is he, you know, he was a rare exception that he like showed up and we sat up until midnight and he just was telling me all about his life. And we loved that child. And, and, um, I think about him all the time, but, um, he was such a sweet, a sweet boy, but I think about him all the time. But, um, but most of the time we don't know. And I think on a practical level, this is just worth paying attention to. It might be a good idea to try to get practitioners who are female, especially if you think a child has had any kind of a trauma, um, sexual trauma from a man. Um, y- you know, we, we book doctor's appointments. We, we have to book doctor's appointments in the first oh. week. And I yeah. don't know if, if parents would even think about just not not, you know, just looking for a female doctor, just on the off chance, right? Yeah. That, that this existed in the yeah. past. 
Um, yeah, and it, it is um, important, but yeah, I, at the time, I mean, I I went to male doctors for a long time and male dentists, and and I always had traumatic feelings about, it and I didn't realize why. I just thought I didn't like going to the doctor. Mm-hmm. Um, and same with, you know, I, I spent a long time just not getting haircuts. Um, of course, at the time, it was kind of the thing, <laughs> you know, long hair, but yeah. um, I, I remembered it because in therapy, I had, we I remembered a dream, and in the dream was this trauma I was experiencing while I was in the a doctor's chair and uh, when I remembered that dream I started realizing that just being there with a male doctor was was re-traumatizing to me sure Um, yeah you're very vulnerable in that setting Um, and and it even in some ways brings you back to a childlike setting because when are other you know when else are you sitting there laying down and they're you know, like at the dentists or whatever. You're laying down, and there's a man standing over you. I mean, if you've had trauma, mm-hmm. that will definitely trigger that. So these are things. And I yeah. mean, you know, I can tell you, we we took our kids to a male dentist. You know, never would have occurred to me to think about whether or not this was an issue for them. And I'm not saying that you should never take your child, but I'm just saying to a male dentist or a male doctor. But it's definitely something to be mindful of. Yeah, it certainly something to, and and they might not even be able to express it but if they if they seem to have real anxiety or, or you know real really don't like going to the doctor or dentist it might be a might be a consideration they just might not be able to express why they just, yeah. You know, yeah they handle it right and, uh, yeah i also had a lot of issues with work because just having men, men in charge and having, you know, a man correct me or, or mm-hmm. give me directions was really hard at first. And, and I, I learned how to cope with it, but it was, it was, um, something that affected my, my work experience for a long time. I just, didn't perform well sometimes when men reminded me of my father, the way they talked or treated me. Yeah. And so I had to learn how to handle that effectively. Uh, You know, another important thing is to find them a therapist that they are comfortable and can trust. Um, Fortunately, I had a male therapist that I really trusted. He actually reminded me of Fred Rogers a lot. He mm. sounded and talked, and and you know I still have great fondness for that therapist. But I, I went through a couple other therapists first, just because I wasn't com- comfortable and couldn't really open up to them. So sometimes mm. it can take a while just to find the person you can. I mean, there's such a huge trust issue with having to open up to a therapist. This is someone you don't know, that you don't know what their motives are necessarily. And you you have to trust them with, you know, the worst part of your life. Yeah. So it can take a while for someone to find just the right therapist even. And as a child, you're not really always given that choice. Sometimes you just end up with a therapist and they can't say, you know, I'm not comfortable with Mm -hmm. so-and-so. Yes, yes. There's also the role that the foster father plays in all of this, if there is one. I mean, there are single foster parents, um, women and men, but um, Carl, my husband, and I have talked a lot about when a new child comes into our home, he is always very mindful of the fact that this child may have history may have trauma in their history from men, whether it's physical abuse. I mean, most of the children we've had have either been victims of abuse themselves, sexual or other violent uh, um, abuse, or they witnessed it between their mom and maybe a boyfriend or something like that. And so my husband is really mindful, and I guess this is kind of a word to foster fathers out there, um, to kind of be mindful of what the child brings. And two things, I mean, this has been in our home, um, 
mindful of it in the sense of don't come on too strong, you know, give them time, just be, be a, a gentle presence in a sense, you know. But then the other side of it is being intentional about being present to them um, because you may be one of the first safe men that they have gotten to know. I mean, it's possible. Exactly. Yeah. They can yeah, very easily be the, the first or only safe. But yeah, um, physical intimacy as far as being affectionate towards them, even just, you know, hugging them and so forth, that might be really difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It's just, you know, the smell of a man's sweat to me is really triggering. Yep. And that could be, and, and even just, there's so many things that can be triggers that it's really hard to be aware of it. Yeah. Whether or not you're making a child comfortable by, you know, giving them affection or if you're making them more uncomfortable. Yes. Um, yeah. But I think if your intentions are, you know, to just give them a safe place, then I think that will be understood. But it can take some time. It definitely takes time. And I think that's one of the big words that I constantly want to repeat to people is time. It takes time. <laughs> and um, yeah. and also, like, my husband doesn't go in the bedroom, like, at all until the child is very obviously comfortable here. So yeah. we've had little ones, we've had older ones, and he just doesn't even go in their bedroom. He doesn't go in to tuck them in, doesn't go in to say goodnight. He, if he's reading books with them, he's doing it on the couch. Um, until, yeah. until they've That's been with fun. us long enough to feel comfortable. And these are just things that, you know, yeah. perhaps are c- precautionary in the sense of they may not be necessary, but it's so much better to err on the side of caution when you have a child who's got trauma. And unfortunately there is often a man somewhere involved in the trauma, whether it is, like I said, a boyfriend of their mother's or you know, it may not even be that the child themselves were victims, but they witnessed it yeah. and whatever that looked like. They um, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so just like on a practical level, foster fathers, you know, let your let the woman take the lead and sort of wait until the child in some sense comes to you. And then, you know, the, the flip side of it is, and this is a different conversation because this is probably outside the scope of your, you know, exper- expertise, but but young girls who were sexually traumatized can often uh, sexualize themselves to men. And I've known foster fathers yeah. who had, you know, 10 or 11 year old girls who were, you know, on, the only way they knew how to relate to men was in a sexual way. And that's a whole different conversation. Um, but worth noting because it does look different. It does look different um, for each child. And, you know, it's super it important to have professional input really early on and, and to really be on a team of professional, you know, like working with a team of professionals to help you as a foster father or foster mother, um, know how to support the kids in your care. So. Yeah. But, it, and it's also important for, for you as a couple to show them what a healthy relationship looks like because they probably have never seen that mm-hmm. and to, to be the example for them to be, yeah. you know, to show them what it's like to, be affectionate to each other, but also, you know, when you do have issues, to have a you know healthy resolution to show what it's like to, you know, disagree, but still be healthy about it. Yeah. Because <clears throat> many of them probably have never seen that before, or experienced that, what it's like for someone to really have a healthy relationship and to see what it's like to be, you know, a, a healthy father, to yes. to be a man that, you know does show affection to his wife and to his kids in a healthy way. Yes, yes. Um, We have a a, a few more minutes, and I would love to hear how healing has looked for you. Um, You began confronting this, acknowledging it, bringing into the light, um, therapy, all of that, in your 30s, I think you said, um, mm-hmm. And now you're at the point, fairly recently, it sounds like, where you are actually willing to talk about it. I mean, 
to open your life in a sense um, in the hopes of helping others. Um, yeah. What has that looked like for you? And what can, how can we help our kids heal? Yeah. Um, it has been a long journey and it is continuing journey. It's a process. I, I started back when I was in my thirties and went to a lot of therapy, individual counseling and also group counseling. And those helped me to cope. I think that that was very important at that time, just to learn how to cope healthfully um, rather than using, you know, abusing drugs and alcohol. And, and they also helped me to learn how to have healthy relationships. But the actual healing part, I think, began when I started having a relationship with Jesus and with my wife, I realized that she loved me for who I was and it didn't matter what had happened to me. And I, I began to actually feel like I, you know, I was a worthwhile person more than mm -hmm. I did before. And mm -hmm. I think that was the main part of my healing was just feeling like I did matter because when you're abused, one of the things that happens is you, you're basically taught that you don't matter, that you're just an object. You're just there to be used. And so to feel like you really do matter yeah. was huge. And then I started to realize that Jesus loved me regardless of what had happened. Actually, he loved me because he wanted to heal me. And when I got healing from Jesus was when... Um, I realized I could talk about what had happened to me and not be um, traumatized anymore. I, you know, for some people, just even bringing it up is traumatic just because feeling of shame. There's so much shame and stigma. And the problem with that is that's keeping people from talking about it, and that just continues the shame and stigma. And I think that's why I'm willing to talk about it now is I want to open the conversation and say, you know, we shouldn't be ashamed. I, I don't feel ashamed anymore. I'm not proud of what happened to me, but I am proud of who I am. And I, I know I stand where I stand in Christ, and I know that's what matters. Mm -hmm. And that's why I want to talk about, that's why I want to open the conversation and say, we don't have to be ashamed. It wasn't our fault. I think the most important thing you can tell a survivor is it wasn't their fault. They didn't deserve what happened to them, yeah. and they deserve to heal. They deserve to have hope. Um, and they do matter, matter to you and they matter to God. I think that's so important to know that God does care about them. I, I felt abandoned and I felt like God didn't care about me because why would he let this happen to me? And that was a really tough one, but I know that God really does care and I think for a long time I felt like, why me? Why did this happen to me? And now I'm realizing, why not? I, I think God has a purpose for me. And the purpose is to show that God can take something terrible and make it a beautiful thing. You know, with, by healing me, he's healed our family. And perhaps maybe I can help other men. So I think the most important thing is just um, know that it does take a long time. It's a, it can take a long time. It's, it's a journey. It's a process, but the most, most important part is to know it wasn't your fault and you don't have to be ashamed. Yeah. Yeah, there's... There's um, 
a theme that I've heard over and over in a number of conversations I've had, um, including on this podcast, um, one of my earlier guests said something very similar to you. Um, She had gone through years, I think, of asking, why me, why me? And she said she was out on a walk or a run one day, and she just sort of all of a sudden had this thought, why not me? And it was a turning point for her when she began to say to herself, um, I'm going to use this to help others and, you know, be there for yeah. others. And, and it sounds very similar. And I feel like one of the things that those of us who are in the, in the supporting position of, you know, supporting youth, supporting children, supporting young people is to say, we need to really have a long view and to not lose hope or heart or perspective on the fact that we, we may never see, like, especially if a child is only with us for a season and not for the rest of their lives, we may never see them come to that point. Point, but um, yeah. we can help propel them to that place of being able to say, okay, you know, it's it's okay to ask for, you know, to have time asking why me. It's a fair question. <laughs> why me is a fair question, yeah. you know. But um, yeah. but then to to just do everything we can to, like you said, message support and love and affirmation and empowerment and seeing them, seeing what matters to them, seeing and, you know, letting them pick the music on the radio, letting them, you know, decorate their bedroom the way they want to, you know, letting them um, pick what's for dinner every now and then or you know, giving them just opportunities to have a voice in your family life. You mentioned earlier, um, I think you even used the word conform, something to the effect of, you know, not expecting a child to come in and conform to your expectations. And I tell people all the time, you know, we as foster families have to be prepared that every time a new child comes into our home, our life is going to be reformed. Our home culture is going to be reformed. And you know, we as a family have, um, we have certain values that are like, um, fundamental and we explain those right off the bat. You know, we really value kindness here and everybody has a voice and, and there, we need to be, you know, we, we value respect and, um, we value respect for our faith. You don't have to share our faith, but you, you know, we, we expect that you're going to be respectful and we'll be respectful of your faith if it's different from ours and all of that. Um, but also being willing to let your home life be reformed, you know, whether it's that you lose a room because that person takes over a bedroom or, you know, um, just, you know, maybe adding different things into your diet because that's what they're used to eating that, you know, their presence in the home shapes has some voice in shaping your home. And I think we really need to be mindful of looking for where that and and letting them know they have a voice here. They have a influence in the home because I think that's really empowering for young people. Oh yeah. Yeah, it is. And, and to recognize that even if you don't agree or like it, that it is their, you know, it is their opinion and their feelings and Mm -hmm. that, you know, affirming them and you know maybe uh, I mean the whole fact that giving them a chance to actually be a part of something that is good rather than being a part of something that's broken yeah this has been so helpful and I so appreciate your willingness to share. I just am so grateful. And I know so many people are going to be, um, helped. I mean, even just like I said, this week, I've heard from people asking me, you know, about supporting young people who've gone through exactly what you have gone through. And so this is just so timely and so helpful. Well, there, I, I highly encourage anyone who's in that position to also, there's a lot of resources and, um, I'm I'm going to do a podcast. I'm working on it as well, but I can send you a list of like, there's so many books Mm -hmm. that are really helpful. There's also a website that there's a a website specifically for male survivors, but it also encourages um, guests, you know, family members and so forth. They're really helpful to understand just the perspectives of being, you know, what it's like to be a survivor. Mm-hmm. And uh, I can send you a list of the books and the websites 
Yes. But I also encourage, and I I kind of hate to say this, but I think it's important. You you should know the suicide prevention hotline mm-hmm. and the crisis line for your area. I don't. I assume that's kind of a given if you're a foster parent, but yeah. I think it is important to know the warning signs of suicide and yeah. isolation because. Um, you don't know what's going to trigger someone and it could trigger them so heavily that it can just happen yes. rapidly. So it's good to know ahead of time yeah. the, you know, what to look for. So I encourage you to know the suicide prevention hotline and the uh, uh, crisis line for your area and, you know, learn more about what the symptoms of suicide or isolation look like. That is such good advice. Yeah, I'll be, I, you'll, you send me those books and I will put all of those resources in the show notes for this podcast episode and in the blog post that will support it. And then when you start your podcast, I will send every audience member of mine over to you. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's been great. I appreciate your interest in this. I, I just pray for all the, all the foster parents, I have to hand you credit. What you're doing is an amazing and beautiful thing. I, I know a couple of foster parents, and I just, I know how hard it is, but how important it is for those kids. I think, I just want to thank all of you foster mm-hmm. parents for what you're doing. Well, it's thank just you. a beautiful thing. Thanks, Kevin. Well, it takes a village, and you are now officially part of ours, so I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. You've been listening to a Fostered Life podcast. For more information and resources for foster parents, please visit afosteredlife.com where you'll find blog posts, recommended books and resources, YouTube videos, and social media links so you can connect with others on the foster parenting journey. If you're interested in supporting my work at A Fostered Life, please go to afosteredlife.com and click on the tab Support My Work. That will take you to my Patreon page where you can become a patron. Just $1 a month helps offset the cost of producing these resources and enables me to offer them freely to new and prospective foster parents, and I'm grateful for the support of my patrons. I also give a few perks to my patrons, so please head over to Patreon and check it out. Also, if you're enjoying this podcast, please take a moment to rate A Fostered Life on iTunes. It would help me out so much. Thanks for listening, and thanks for caring about foster care.